The Origin of Species, Chapter 4, Natural Selection, by Charles Darwin, read by Rabbit Ape. Natural Selection, its power compared with man's selection, its power on characters of trifling importance, its power at all ages and on both sexes, sexual selection, on the generality of intercrosses between individuals of the same species, circumstances favorable and unfavorable to natural selection, namely intercrossing, isolation, number of individuals, slow action, extinction caused by natural selection, divergence of character related to the diversity of inhabitants of any small area and to naturalization, Action of natural selection through divergence of character and extinction on the descendants from a common parent. Explains the grouping of all organic beings. How will the struggle for existence, discussed too briefly in the last chapter, act in regard to variation? Can the principle of selection, which we have seen is so potent in the hands of man, apply in nature? I think we shall see that it can act most effectually. Let it be borne in mind in what an endless number of strange peculiarities our domestic productions, and in a lesser degree, those under nature, vary, and how strong the hereditary tendency is. Under domestication, it may be truly said that the whole organization becomes in some degree plastic. Let it be borne in mind how infinitely complex and close-fitting are the mutual relations of all organic beings to each other and to their physical conditions of life. Can it then be thought improbable, seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred, that other variations, useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life, should sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations. If such do occur, can we doubt, remembering that many more individuals are born than can possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. Variations neither useful nor injurious would not be affected by natural selection and would be left a fluctuating element as perhaps we see in the species called polymorphic. We shall best understand the probable course of natural selection by taking the case of a country undergoing some physical change, for instance, of climate. The proportional numbers of its inhabitants would almost immediately undergo a change, and some species might become extinct. We may conclude from what we have seen of the intimate and complex manner in which the inhabitants of each country are bound together, that any change in the numerical proportions of some of the inhabitants, independently of the change of climate itself, would most seriously affect many of the others. If the country were open on its borders, new forms would certainly immigrate and this also would seriously disturb the relations of some of the former inhabitants. Let it be remembered how powerful the influence of a single introduced tree or mammal has been shown to be. But in the case of an island, or of a country partly surrounded by barriers into which new and better adapted forms could not freely enter, we should then have places in the economy of nature which would assuredly be better filled up if some of the original inhabitants were in some manner modified. For, had the area been open to immigration, these same places would have been seized on by intruders. In such case, every slight modification, which in the course of ages chanced to arise, 
and which in any way favored the individuals of any of the species by better adapting them to their altered conditions would tend to be preserved and natural selection would thus have free scope for the work of improvement. We have reason to believe, as stated in the first chapter, that a change in the conditions of life by specially acting on the reproductive system causes or increases variability. And in the foregoing case, the conditions of life are supposed to have undergone a change, and this would manifestly be favorable to natural selection by giving a better chance of profitable variations occurring. And unless profitable variations do occur, natural selection can do nothing. Not that, as I believe, any extreme amount of variability is necessary, as man can certainly produce great results by adding up in any given direction mere individual differences, so could nature, but far more easily from having incomparably longer time at her disposal. Nor do I believe that any great physical change, as of climate, or any unusual degree of isolation to check immigration, is actually necessary to produce new and unoccupied places for natural selection to fill up by modifying and improving some of the varying inhabitants. For as all of the inhabitants of each country are struggling together with nicely balanced forces, extremely slight modifications in the structure or habits of one inhabitant would often give it an advantage over others, and still further modifications of the same kind would often still further increase the advantage. No country can be named in which all the native inhabitants are now so perfectly adapted to each other and to the physical conditions under which they live that none of them could anyhow be improved. For in all countries, the natives have been so far conquered by naturalized productions that they have allowed foreigners to take firm possession of the land. And as foreigners have thus everywhere beaten some of the natives, we may safely conclude that the natives might have been modified with advantage so as to have better resisted such intruders. As man can produce, and certainly has produced, a great result by his methodical and unconscious means of selection, what may not nature effect? Man can act only on external and visible characters. Nature cares nothing for appearances, except so far as they may be useful to any being. She can act on every internal organ, on every shade of constitutional difference, on the whole machinery of life. Man selects only for his own good, nature only for that of the being which she tends. Every selected character is fully exercised by her, and the being is placed under well-suited conditions of life. Man keeps the natives of many climates in the same country. He seldom exercises each selected character in some peculiar and fitting manner. He feeds a long and a short-beaked pigeon on the same food. He does not exercise a long-backed or long-legged quadruped in any peculiar manner. He exposes sheep with long and short wool to the same climate. He does not allow the most vigorous males to struggle for the females. He does not rigidly destroy all inferior animals, but protects during each varying season, as far as lies in his power, all his productions. He often begins his selection by some half-monstrous form, or at least by some modification prominent enough to catch his eye or to be plainly useful to him. Under nature, the slightest difference of structure or constitution may well turn the nicely balanced scale in the struggle for life and so be preserved. How fleeting are the wishes and efforts of man, how short his time, and consequently how poor will his products be compared with those accumulated by nature during whole geological periods. Can we wonder, then, that nature's productions should be far truer in character than man's productions, that they should be infinitely better adapted to the most complex conditions of life, and should plainly bear the stamp of far higher workmanship? 
it may be said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, silently and insensibly working whenever and wherever opportunity offers at the improvement of each organic being in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life. We may see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long lapses of ages, and then so imperfect is our view into long past geological ages that we only see that the forms of life are now different than what they formerly were. Although natural selection can act only through and for the good of each being, yet characters and structures, which we are apt to consider as of very trifling importance, may thus be acted on. When we see leaf-eating insects green and bark feeders mottled gray, the alpine ptarmigan white in winter, the red grouse the color of heather, and the black grouse that of peaty earth, we must believe that these tints are of service to these birds and insects in preserving them from danger. Grouse, if not destroyed at some period of their lives, would increase in countless numbers. They are known to suffer largely from birds of prey, and hawks are guided by eyesight to their prey, so much so that on parts of the continent persons are warned not to keep white pigeons as being the most liable to destruction. Hence I can see no reason to doubt that natural selection might be most effective in giving the proper color to each kind of grouse and in keeping that color, when once acquired, true and constant. Nor ought we to think that the occasional destruction of an animal of any particular color would produce little effect. We should remember how essential it is in a flock of white sheep to destroy every lamb with the faintest trace of black. In plants, the down of the fruit and the color of the flesh are considered by botanists as characters of the most trifling importance. Yet we hear from an excellent horticulturalist, Downing, that in the United States, smooth-skinned fruits suffer far more from a beetle, a curculio, than those with down, that purple plums suffer far more from a certain disease than yellow plums, whereas another disease attacks yellow-fleshed peaches far more than those with other colored flesh. If, with all the aids of art, these slight differences make a great difference in cultivating the several varieties, assuredly in a state of nature where the trees would have to struggle with other trees and with a host of enemies, such differences would effectually settle which variety, whether a smooth or downy, a yellow or purple-fleshed fruit, should succeed. In looking at many small points of difference between species, which, as far as our ignorance permits us to judge, seem to be quite unimportant, we must not forget that climate, food, etc. probably produce some slight and direct effect. It is, however, far more necessary to bear in mind that there are many unknown laws of correlation of growth, which, when one part of the organization is modified through variation, and the modifications are accumulated by natural selection for the good of the being, will cause other modifications, often of the most unexpected nature. As we see that those variations which under domestication appear at any particular period of life tend to reappear in the offspring at the same period, for instance in the seeds of the many varieties of our culinary and agricultural plants, in the caterpillar and cocoon stages of the varieties of the silkworm, in the eggs of poultry, and in the color of the down of their chickens, in the horns of our sheep and cattle when nearly adult, so in a state of nature, natural selection will be enabled to act on and modify organic beings at any age by the accumulation of profitable variations at that age and by the inheritance at a corresponding age. If it profit a plant, 
to have its seeds more and more widely disseminated by the wind, I can see no greater difficulty in this being affected through natural selection than in the cotton planter increasing and improving by selection the down in the pods of his cotton trees. Natural selection may modify and adapt the larva of an insect to a score of contingencies wholly different from those which concern the mature insect. These modifications will no doubt affect, through the laws of correlation, the structure of the adult, and probably in the case of those insects which live only for a few hours and which never feed, a large part of their structure is merely the correlated result of successive changes in the structure of their larvae. So, conversely, modifications in the adult will probably often affect the structure of the larva, but in all cases, natural selection will ensure that modifications consequent on other modifications at a different period of life shall not be in the least degree injurious for if they become so, they would cause the extinction of the species. Natural selection will modify the structure of the young in relation to the parent and of the parent in relation to the young. In social animals, it will adapt the structure of each individual for the benefit of the community, if each in consequence profits by the selected change. What natural selection cannot do is to modify the structure of one species without giving it any advantage for the good of another species, and though statements to this effect may be found in works of natural history, I cannot find one case which will bear investigation. A structure used only once in an animal's whole life, if of high importance to it, might be modified to any extent by natural selection. For instance, the great jaws possessed by certain insects and used exclusively for opening the cocoon or the hard tip of the beak of nestling birds used for breaking the egg. It has been asserted that the best short-beaked tumbler pigeons more perish in the egg than are able to get out of it so that fanciers assist in the act of hatching. Now, if nature had to make the beak of a full-grown pigeon very short for the bird's own advantage, the process of modification would be very slow, and there would be simultaneously the most rigorous selection of the young birds within the egg, which had the most powerful and hardest beaks, for all with weak beaks would inevitably perish, or more delicate and more easily broken shells might be selected, the thickness of the shell being known to vary like every other structure. Sexual Selection Inasmuch as peculiarities often appear under domestication in one sex and become hereditarily attached to that sex, the same fact probably occurs under nature, and if so, Natural selection will be able to modify one sex in its functional relations to the other sex or in relation to wholly different habits of life in the two sexes, as is sometimes the case with insects. And this leads me to say a few words on what I call sexual selection. This depends not on a struggle for existence, but on a struggle between the males for possession of the females. The result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. Sexual selection is, therefore, less rigorous than natural selection. Generally, the most vigorous males, those which are best fitted for their places in nature, will leave most progeny. But in many cases, victory will depend not on general vigor, but on having special weapons confined to the male sex. A hornless stag or spurless cock would have a poor chance of leaving offspring. Sexual selection, by always allowing the victor to breed, might surely give indomitable courage, length to the spur, and strength to the wing to strike in the spurred leg, as well as the brutal cockfighter, who knows well that he can improve his breed 
by careful selection of the best cocks. How low in the scale of nature this law of battle descends, I know not. Male alligators have been described as fighting, bellowing, and whirling around like Indians in a war dance for the possession of the females. Male salmons have been seen fighting all day long. Male stag beetles often bear wounds from the huge mandibles of other males. The war is, perhaps, severest between the males of polygamous animals, and these seem oftenest provided with special weapons. The males of carnivorous animals are already well armed, though to them and to others, special means of defense may be given through means of sexual selection, as the mane to the lion, the shoulder pad to the boar, and the hooked jaw to the male salmon, for the shield may be as important for victory as the sword or spear. Amongst birds, the contest is often of a more peaceful character. All those who have attended to the subject believe that there is the severest rivalry between the males of many species to attract by singing to the females. The rock thrush of Guinea, birds of paradise, and some others congregate, and successive males display their gorgeous plumage and perform strange antics before the females, which, standing by as spectators, at last choose the most attractive partner. Those who have closely attended to birds in confinement well know that they often take individual preferences and dislikes. Thus, Sir R. Heron has described how one pied peacock was eminently attractive to all his hen birds. It may appear childish to attribute any effect to such apparently weak means. I cannot here enter on the details necessary to support this view, but if man can in a short time give elegant carriage and beauty to his bantams according to his standard of beauty, I can see no good reason to doubt that female birds, by selecting during thousands of generations the most melodious or beautiful males according to their standard of beauty, might produce a marked effect. I strongly suspect that some well-known laws with respect to the plumage of male and female birds, in comparison with the plumage of the young, can be explained on the view of plumage having been chiefly modified by sexual selection, acting when the birds have come to the breeding age or during the breeding season, the modifications thus produced being inherited at corresponding ages or seasons, either by the males alone or by the males and females, but I have not space here to enter on the subject. Thus it is, as I believe, that when the males and females of any animal have the same general habits of life, but differ in structure, color, or ornament, such differences have been mainly caused by sexual selection. That is, individual males have had, in successive generations, some slight advantage over other males in their weapons, means of defense, or charms, and have transmitted these advantages to their male offspring. Yet I would not wish to attribute all such sexual differences to this agency, for we see peculiarities arising and becoming attached to the male sex in our domestic animals, as the wattle in male carriers, horn-like protuberances in the cocks of certain fowls, etc., which we cannot believe to be either useful to the males in battle or attractive to the females. We see analogous cases under nature. For instance, the tuft of hair on the breast of the turkey cock, which can hardly be either useful or ornamental to this bird. Indeed, had the tuft appeared under domestication, it would have been called a monstrosity.